is it that we're supposed to do? Go and make disciples. Um, and it had me thinking about what's what's the point of Sunday morning service? Do we have any race fans? Really? Oh my! There we go. Okay, at least one. Uh, do, you, does, do you know what a pit stop is? Um, so, and I don't know why this came to my, my, my mind, but this because I don't like racing. Um, I, well, I don't like my dad's racing. Just circle, circle, circle for 14 hours, and he sleeps the whole time and then gets mad when he changes channel. Um, but I was thinking about what's the point of Sunday morning service, and to me it reminds me of the pit stop. The, the point of the race is to win the race. Um, to do that, you have to stop, you have to recover, you have to refresh, you need new tires, you need gas. Sunday morning, what we're doing here this morning is about that. It's about getting back in front of the Father um, with other people who love Him to rub shoulders with each other and encourage one another and, and, and listen to what it is that God's prepared in Donnie for our hearts um, so that we can be refreshed and renewed for, for the race that is this week. Um, and then you're going to come back and take a pit stop next week, and we're going to do the same thing. And so everything that we do this, sun, this, this morning um, is for that purpose. Um, to get you back in front of the in the in the throne room in front of God, um, so that you can sing praises to His name, that we can commune with Him um, through the taking of of the the elements, the the juice and the, and the cracker, um, to refuel us, to refresh us. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to open with a word of prayer. If you guys want to go ahead and stand up, um, we're going to sing praises to His name because He's worthy. Father God, we are so thankful. Um, we are a blessed people because You're a good God. Um, God, there are so many storms in our lives right now, and, and, and all of us have our own thing that we're going through and working through, and, and, and it's a struggle. God, help us this morning to lay those things at your feet, um, to share those burdens with each other. God, that we can lift each other up and push each other forward, um, because there's a race, um, and, and we've got to keep running. Um, and God, ultimately, at the end of all of this, we get, to, we get to go and be with you in heaven, and it's the greatest reward. God, we thank you for Jesus who made that possible. Um, and we just praise your name. God, we, we, we praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. 
for a moment. I have something I have to share with you. Dustin is like, what is going on? Well, he didn't know. That's our communication. So I just want to stop and say real quick how proud and excited I am for this church, um, how you guys step up to do stuff. Um, we have a plunge that we're trying to raise money for, and I'm excited to say that we have met a certain goal, okay? A certain goal. Um, just this morning before service, we were just at 4,000, which, Connor, you're getting it. So right after Sunday school, it went to 4,800. So, so after tabulating everything, our total is now 5,700. <laughs> Nope, that's back up. <laughs> 5,793. Not only did you make this really big goal um, in a short amount of time, but you guys did it with excellence. You did it with excitement and joy. And that is just amazing that you're going to help so many kids be able to go to camp this year without the, the financial detriment onto their family for those who can't make it. And that's what you guys do, and I am so excited about that. And so with that joy, let's stand back up and get back into a song. And don't forget, Saturday, you can see it on Facebook or come and watch live. Dustin, get a cold bath. Thank you, guys. He, he did that once a long time ago. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, <laughs> 
Romans 15, 3 through 4 says this. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord, God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So I'm not Rod. I got a text at about 12.30 last night after he got done cleaning up for the wedding uh, asking me to come up. I, I offered, but of course I wasn't prepared, so I was scrambling this morning. with. Usually I try to put a little bit more prayer into my communion devotion, so it's got a little prayer and hopefully the Holy Spirit just kind of took it from there. So. Here we go. Um, so yesterday, I got to experience a winter wedding. So uh, that is something that we really haven't experienced before, which it actually really turned out great. Um, uh, this was a wedding that uh, our family's really been looking to forward to for a long time. 
Um, and it couldn't have been more perfect. Um, the white snow uh, and the white wedding dress was definitely stunning, to say the least. And I know there was a lot of illustrations. I could go into the Bible with white as snow and all this other stuff, but some of the things that I just mentioned, uh, but for me, I wanted to focus on how much I was looking forward to this wedding because of the love I have for the bride and groom. Um, God is also looking forward to a time, and that time uh, is when we come and give our lives to Him. He's looking, He's a loving Father that can't wait till we come home. It says in Matthew 7, 7, 8, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who receives, and he who seeks, finds, and him who knocks, it will be opened. So in this time of communion, think about the sacrifice made by Jesus for us to freely come and be saved. Also consider opening that door to God if you have not. He is anxiously awaiting. Let's pray. Lord, uh, just thank you for this beautiful time of year that, you know, when we do have the snow, that we can just uh, look at the whiteness and the pureness of it and just think of you and just the pureness of you and just thank you for giving us this time that we can uh, just focus on what you did for us and have a time that we can have communion with you and uh, just give our thanks to you and give others opportunities to consider giving their lives to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. good to see you today. Kids, there is no junior church. There is a, a little half sheet bulletin for you in the back, so make sure you have your uh, crayons. Fill that out, and if you fill that out at the end, you do get a piece of candy for it. This year, we are looking um, at on our true foundation. That's our theme this year, building our lives on the foundation of Jesus so we can have an unwavering faith. Our theme scripture for this year is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone, part of that foundation of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. That's part of that foundation we are building into. He's putting us into it. What's more, you are his holy priest. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As, as the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him, meaning Jesus. But for those who reject him, the stone the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone, and he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. There is a whole lot in these verses. And all year long, we're going to be looking at Jesus, the foundation of all that we're going to build our lives on, putting it all on him. Today, we finally get into the New Testament. And we're going to start with the Gospels. As a churchy word for people who have never been raised in the church, what is a gospel? Well, the gospel means good news. That's what the word means. So if it was the gospel of Matthew, that means the good news written by Matthew. When we talk about the gospels, we're talking about the first four books in the Bible of the New Testament, Gen um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm going to teach you a Greek word, Okay. So I want you all to say this. It's going to be on the screen. Euangelion. You, and that wasn't bad. Good job. Euangelion. 
So you can see the, the English way for you to read it, but the, there's the Greek way. Okay? That is good news or good message. That's what's translated to gospel. It was a term that was originally used in wartime. The word gospel was. Okay? When a distant battle took place, runners would go and bring messages back to the city, letting them know what was happening on the front line. And these were the ones who had the good news, the Yuangaleon. Okay? Those who brought the good news from the war were called evangelists. That's really what they were called, because they were the ones who would bring that good news. The good news that your city's army was beating the enemy. The good news that your father, your uncle, your brother had uh, survived and will be heading home. The good news that war is over and victory is assured. For the next several weeks, we are going to look at the real good news. The Yuangaleon, according to the four different authors. We have four different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each writer has a reason that they wrote in their own style, in their own viewpoint, and because of this, we get four different aspects of Jesus, different viewpoints. And you're going to hear people say, well, they contradict each other, and I'm going to tell you right now, though, they don't, okay? There are times that it might appear that way to us, but when we actually look at it and dig into it, you're going to find they don't contradict, they actually support and elevate each other. These four different aspects, different viewpoints, never contradict. For the next few weeks, we're going to look at an overview, just kind of like a a 3,000 feet view of each gospel writer to see who wrote it, when, and what they wrote, when they wrote it, what they wrote, and what that can mean to each of us. So the first gospel, the first Leon, Matthew. Now, who is Matthew? Matthew was a tax collector. How many of you like tax collectors? So now you know how people looked at him as well. He was not really welcome or wanted, and yet Jesus came up to Matthew. He visited him, and he said to Matthew, come and follow me. And Matthew ended up writing this gospel account around 55 to 65 A.D. Okay? 55 to 65 80. That means it's 20 to 30 years after Jesus ascended. That's still pretty close. What we also can tell is the Gospel of Matthew is an eyewitness account of the life of Christ. It's an eyewitness. He didn't research this. He didn't have to go and ask a bunch of people. He was there. He saw it. Um, He experienced it. So far this year, we've had a brief journey through the Old Testament the past few Sundays, and what we saw was Jesus was not only there, he was vital in all the Old Testament. The Old Testament points forward towards the prophesied Messiah, the Savior. The Old Testament reveals our human need. We need a Savior. We need someone to help us because of our sins. The New Testament supplies that need. We cannot think of them as separate things that don't connect. The Old Testament and the New Testament are one continuation story from God's love to you, to seek after you, to find you, to save you, and to bring you home. It's all congruent. It comes together. Now, when we look at the four Gospels, okay, I'm going to say this. I think Matthew, more than the other ones who wrote, had the deepest appreciation for mercy of God and to show him grace. Matthew was a tax collector, and while tax collectors were Jewish citizens, they were also employed by the Roman government, and these tax collectors would often take a little bit more than they should to line their own pockets. They were taking the hard-earned money of their working brethren, the fellow Jews, and giving it to the enemy. Tax collectors in Jesus' days were viewed as traitors. They would actually elevate a Roman over a tax collector. They would like Samaritans better than tax collectors at times. They were the lowest class of society among the sinners, the prostitutes. But tax collectors made good money, and they were 
even though they were viewed as lepers among their own people, no one wanted to be around them. And then here comes Jesus, and he walks right up to Matthew and shows mercy and grace and calls him to follow him to become a disciple. And the wonder and awe that Matthew had for his Savior are continued and contained within these pages of his gospel that we can see this. He saw Jesus differently than the others because he was the outcast. He was the one that nobody wanted, and yet the Savior came and personally invited him. Now, each gospel tells a particular aspect of the story of Jesus. All four gospels are required to tell the whole story. A vision seen by the prophet Ezekiel provides an interesting information. So we're going to back up just to get a little bit into the Old Testament. Ezekiel 1, 10. This is what it says. Their faces look like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being, and on the right side each had the face of a lion, and on the left side face of an ox, and also had the face of a lion, uh, of an eagle. What we see here is a sci-fi creature. This is a weird creature that has four faces, a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. And Ezekiel saw this as a prophet, and he was looking forward to that day. But it's not just in the Old Testament. Now let's fast forward to the last book of the Bible in Revelation. These four creatures in Revelation chapter 4, in front of the throne, right in front of God, was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were the four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. Eyes meaning so they could see everything. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. third had a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. We see the four creatures repeated. And if it's repeated, it's important. These four faces were the symbolized of the four tribes, or the four areas, the tribes of Israel. Now, the, the leading tribe of each one, we'll see in a minute, but the lion was the symbol of the tribe of Judah, and then there were a couple others underneath him. The ox was the symbol of the tribe of Ephraim. The man was the symbol of Reuben, and the eagle was the symbol of the tribe of Dan. Judah the lion camped on the east, or the right-hand side, opposite of Ephraim, you can see here. The ox was on the west. Dan, um, yeah, the eagle camped north of Reuben, man. So, look here. So, I just said that they were on the right-hand side was the lion. On the other side is the ox. North, eagle, south was man. That's how they camped around the temple. And these creatures represented the four areas around the temple as well. The point was, all four of these creatures were a way that people could associate for different aspects of God. Okay? And once again, we're going to see these four areas all point to the center. They point to God around their object of their devotion. And so it's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. Now let's look again at Jeremiah 23. For the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just and right throughout the land, and this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness. In that day, Judah will be saved. Judah, right-hand side there, and Israel will live in safety. Jump a few chapters or books to Micah 5.2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will come forth for me to be the ruler in Israel. His times of coming forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. eternity. The Jewish people were looking for a real king, a king in the line of Judah, a king from the line of David, a descendant. Now go to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of who? David and Abraham. What, what lineage, what tribe is David from? Judah. The first thing we see here in Matthew, Jesus is presented first and foremost as the Messianic king, the son of the royal house of David, the lion of the tribe of Judah. God promised a king. 
He promised David that a king would come from him. Last year we looked at David. And we even read the scripture in 2 Samuel that where God says a ancestor will come from you who will sit on your throne forever. He would reign forever. Only Christ, the divine Son of God, could fulfill this prophecy. And there are another number of times through the, the book of Matthew where Jesus is referred to as the Son of David. Go down a few verses to chapter, uh, verse 17. Matthew 1, 17. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David. Now, Abraham's the beginning of all the promises, right? So there's 14 generations from the beginning of the tribes to David. Fourteen from David to the exile to Babylon, so the people leave and they're cast out. And fourteen from the exile to coming back to the Messiah. He's pointing out that Jesus is the true king, the promised king. The king is coming. And it's all been in the Old Testament. Okay? The Old Testament pointed to it. Remember I said it reveals the need. We need a king. Royal, uh, Jesus' royalty is further emphasized when the Magi, the wise men, come from the east. They come to Herod, and this is what they say in Matthew 2, 2. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and had come to worship him. They came to worship a king, a person who was born king. Herod had to work his way to become king of that area. But this child is going to be born king. Not only is he going to be born king, but there is a sign up in the heavens that is pointing to his splendor and his majesty. Herod doesn't like that. These wise men come to the boy Jesus, who was two years old at that time. You can tell that your nativities are wrong, just so you know. The wise men showed up when Jesus was a toddler. They bow before a toddler and worship him offering gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The wealth and authority and power of these gifts was only going to be given to one of royalty. Can you imagine going and bowing down and giving your allegiance to a toddler? That'd be wrong and just psychotic. But that's what they did. Matthew points this out, that these wise men from the east... We're coming to see the lion, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the real king. Not only does Matthew point out that Jesus came as the king, but he shows that Jesus claims to be the king, that the king claims this royalty. What I mean by that, Jesus actually claims to be the king, the Messiah, not just accepts it, but claims it. Zechariah 9.9, 9, in the Old Testament, rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is a very pointed prophecy. A couple of weeks ago, I said that when uh, Satan was just being a little pest to God, God says, hey, one's coming, and he's going to come this way. And then he kept narrowing that focus, that prophecy, so that Satan knew that it was coming here. He's going to be in Bethlehem. And this is how you'll know Satan and all people. He's going to ride on a donkey. This is a very pointed prophecy about the coming king, one that everyone would look for. If you purposely did this, you were claiming to be a king. Matthew 21. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of them ahead. Go to that village over there. He said, as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. That is a proclamation. That is a claim. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take it. You know why they do that? The Lord needs them. The king. The king needs them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that had said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on the donkey's colt. Jesus purposely told the disciples to do this. This is a purpose, on purpose. It's intentional. Jesus just said, I am fulfilling this prophecy. I am the king. 
Matthew shows us that Jesus purposely claims this. Later in the same chapter, in verse 12, uh, 12 and 13, Jesus enters the temple courts and drove out all those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of, of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Is it written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. The same day Jesus comes in and says, I am going to be king. I'm going to ride on this. Then he purposely, intentionally rides up to the temple, goes in, and cleanses it. He's showing and claiming his authority as the only one who can do this. He fulfills prophecy, declares that this is his house. This isn't a time where Jesus tries to teach. He doesn't walk up and say, hey guys, you are, you're shortchanging your people. And what we really need to do is for you to repent. Give that money back and let's support a mission. That's not what he does. He throws the tables. He scatters it. He shows that this is wrong and a king demands righteousness in his home. People didn't argue with that because they could see his power and authority. He is the king. There's only two reasons Jesus would act this way. Either he's a lunatic or he is the real king. There's one more area that Matthew showcases Jesus' king that we need to look at today. We saw him, the king is coming, and we see in the Old Testament, and then it happens in verse 1. We saw that Jesus claimed to be king. Matthew 7, verses 28 and 29. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings because he had taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. This is really key here. He didn't teach like a normal person who just had a bunch of information and regurgitated it back out. He taught with real authority. He displayed that authority. Jesus had authority over diseases, over demons. He had the authority to forgive sins and ultimately had the authority over death itself. Jesus shows compassion in his judgments here. In uh, chapter 19, the people brought their little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked him. This is what they say. Hey, hey, don't bother Jesus. He's busy teaching. He doesn't have time for those little kids. Go wipe their noses and take care of them. Don't bother the master with this. And Jesus said, let the little children. We don't get this in English, okay? But in Greek, it was a command. You bring them here. Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In fact, you disciples, you are wrong. You should follow them as they come to me. He shows compassion on these little kids. Jesus casts out the demon from the Canaanite's daughter. He heals a Roman centurion's servants. Both of them were non-Jews. He's not just doing it for the so-called Jewish people only. The king wants all peoples, all nations, all languages, all races, all tribes of all mankind to come into his kingdom. In connection with Jesus' birth, we read of his identity and nature in chapter 1, verse 23. The virgin will conceive, conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. In Matthew, we find Jesus in the midst of the crowds. He is with them. The king is not far off. He is right here. He's teaching them, healing them, dealing with their afflictions. We find Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners in Matthew chapter 9. We find Jesus welcoming the children to come to him. And even though the disciples see them as distraction, Jesus is not once at all dismayed by people wanting to come to the real king. He's among his people, dwelling with them, being accessible to them. And then we come to the end of the gospel, following Jesus' own resurrection. And he states at the end of the book, in chapter 28, verses 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all, all authority in heaven and on earth. Because I've been given all that authority, therefore you need to do this. 
Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey my commands that I have given. And be sure of this. I am with you always to the end of the age. Right here, this section here, Matthew 28, we don't find that anywhere else. Because Matthew is trying to make sure we know it is the king's job here. He is telling us the real character of the king. He rules over all of creation, over the realm of the spirits of the invisible and the visible. There's not a single corner of the universe that is outside of his authority or influence. In all this, we see Matthew showing the king's character. From dealing with the little kids compassionately, to rebuking the evil that is so much trying to consume his chosen people. He has complete authority over it all. And even though Jesus the King has complete authority, His final earthly command is to go out, find more people, and bring them into the kingdom. He's the lion. Several years ago, we got to go to um, a zoo up in Lansing, Michigan, and when we lived up there. And it was kind of a rainy day, and I'm going to tell you right now, that's the best day to go to the zoo. When it's not hot, because not only will you be comfortable, but so will the animals. And then they're more active. And we got to see this lion, and it was this male lion got up on the rock, the main rock in its enclosure, and it roared. And it wasn't something you heard as much as you felt. I mean, it rattled your bones. And I was like, oh my goodness, that is so cool. And we listened to it a few times, and then we went out and started seeing the other animals. And guess what? When we were on the other side of the zoo, guess what we kept hearing? The lion was roaring. And you know what the other animals did? They jumped a little bit each time. The king of the jungle was commanding attention, and everybody heard it. Everybody was at awe. The book of Matthew is saying the king, the king of the universe, is roaring his victory, and he wants you to join him. There's only one reason you should tremble at the lion's roar. If you're the prey. But if you're on the victor's side, that's when you roar in anticipation and excitement of the victory. Jesus, his earthly command is for us to go and fill the kingdom. This is the lion. This is what Matthew shows us. So when you read through the book of Matthew, you need to always look at Jesus as the king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who has the power, the authority, the royalty, the majesty. And it will dictate and show you and bring out all those nuances of how Jesus is acting. He didn't come to conquer people, but to show compassion, care, and, and passion for those that were lost. The king, the righteous one, to rule is what Matthew shows us. So then it comes down to this. Are you ready to give your allegiance? Are you ready to enlist into the lion's life? Are you ready to make your encampment into his kingdom? The lion is going to roar once more in the end. And Scripture says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And here's the difference. Some people will fall to their knees trembling because they were wrong and they have to confess it before they go meet their fate in hell. The rest are going to be falling down to their knees and saying, yes, it's him. He is here and I get to go home with my king. Which will you choose? The king is offering. King is offering not just himself, but above himself the kingdom of his Father for you to live in for eternity. He purposely took your sins away so that you could become royalty, just like him. So, what will you choose? You've never chosen Jesus if you've never given your life to him. We want to give you a chance where you can come talk with us. We'll we'll pray with you. If you've got some issues in the back room, we can pray with you. But what is keeping you from coming to the king? Because here's the really great thing. The king left the throne room of heaven. 
He stepped across the cosmos and stepped into mankind. He stepped into the history books of the world. He actually stepped into flesh to take your sins, to pay the penalty of what you and I have done, to carry them into the grave so that you and I can live eternally in righteousness. And all you have to do is to let go of that old and cling to the King. Will you do that? Let's stand and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are a King. A King that comes to us. A King that loves us. A King that conquered sin and death. A King that forgives. God, help us to not forget your royalty, your majesty, your holiness. Forgive us when we doubt it. God, help us to step and live within that kingdom and to bring more people to you. I thank you that your roar has brought so many people to salvation, that your power has protected so many people who have trusted in you. And I ask that you help us to become those living stones that are living upon the foundation of your truth, of your Son. We pray this all in your Son's name. Amen. You shine in the shadows. You in the 
so good. Um, I love that song. I love that song more because I get to hear you guys sing it. Um, and, and that surrender that, that it's not my fight, it's God's. And, and, and again, he's the lion. Um, and I, if I'm going to fight on anyone's team, I want the lion on my side because <laughs> um, there's a victory. But um, there's a lot of announcements in the bulletin. I'm not going to tell you any of them. Read it. I believe in you. I trust you. You can do it. Um, with that being said, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad, again, that we get to do this together. I love you so much. I'm thankful for you. Um, I hope you have a blessed week, and we'll see you next week.